we have with us today Dr. Donald Painter. Uh, Dr. Painter currently serves in the role of Dean of Academic Success at Polk State College, where he's been since 2006. He has served in the Florida College system for nearly 15 years as an administrator and faculty member. He has held progressively responsible administrative positions, including department coordinator, associate dean of academic affairs, dean of academic affairs, and now dean of academic success. He has also served as the interim vice president for academic affairs at the request of the college president during Polk State's recent presidential transition. He is a past participant in the Chancellor's Leadership Seminar, leader of Polk State's Guided Pathways Initiative, and has a strong interest in encouraging faculty pursue administrative positions within the system. Dr. Painter holds a PhD in Higher Education Administration from the University of South Florida, a Master's and Bachelor's in Communication, also from USF, and an AA from St. Petersburg College. He's one of our alums. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Painter. Well, thank you for that welcome. Good afternoon. It's fantastic to be here with you today. I want to just start by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to present and to interview for this position. Um, as an alum of SPC, you know, and I'll talk about that in a minute, this was really an honor and a privilege, so thank you. And for those of our colleagues who are watching on video, you know, thank you for your time and the time you'll take to watch this. And most importantly for everyone, thank you for your engagement in this important process. Because obviously I don't need to tell you how important this position is. Uh, I'm going to get started today by sharing a little bit of my St. Petersburg College story. So when I graduated high school, I wasn't the best student. I didn't have strong grades. I didn't have money saved up for college. I didn't have a car and I didn't even have a driver's license. So I enrolled at St. Petersburg College or St. Petersburg Junior College as it was known at the time. And the only way I was able to get to school was I picked out classes that were all the same times as those that my best friend Dan was taking because he was also enrolled here at SPC. And yes, I was that guy that bummed a ride from his best friend for the entire first year of college while I got a job, saved money, and eventually was able to buy a car. And it was here at SPC where I figured out what my true calling was. When I first went to college, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But the problem was that I had some trouble with biology and with math. And my mom, as I mentioned a moment ago, was a nurse. And she sat me down and said, you know, you're either not doing what you need to be doing to be successful, or maybe medicine really isn't your passion. But either way, you need to figure something out. So I ended up enrolling in the required public speaking course that students take here at SPC. And after I delivered my first speech, my teacher approached me and asked me if I would join the speech and debate team. And I said yes, and I did that. And it was through that opportunity that I discovered that what I had a passion for studying was speech and human communication. That what I wanted to do was teach. I wanted to work in education and help students the way that my speech professor helped me when she invited me to join the team. The way my math and biology professors helped me when I made way too many visits to their offices during office hours, like way too many. And the way my business professor helped me when I approached him to say that I was thinking of dropping out of college, and he told me what a stupid idea that would be. Now, no trip down memory lane would be complete without some really embarrassing photos, and I've chosen a couple to share with you today. Um, these, are, <laughs> these are all from my time here at SPC, and specifically when I was on the speech and debate team. The van's in the background there as proof. Um, I'll let you, as you look at these, kind of make a decision about what you think my real hair color is, and we can, we can maybe figure that out later. Um, but fortunately, my task here today is uh, not to show, and I, I made them quick too so that you know you had to take a quick picture quick screenshot for um, blackmail purposes down the road uh, but fortunately my task here today is not to show embarrassing photos of myself what it is is to outline my vision for enhancing student success at st. Petersburg College and specifically talking about the areas that I would focus on as vice president for academic affairs and some of the strategies that I would use to make a difference and make an impact in those areas and I'm going to begin by doing this by talking a little bit about my leadership style and specifically some of the values that guide me as a leader. And this is important for me because any approach that I would develop to increase student success is going to be driven by these leadership values. 
You know, I value communication. Obviously, that's my field of study, so I tend to you know, value communicating with other people. And I'm a strong believer in open, transparent, and honest communication. My phone, my door, my inbox, my text messages, they're always open, and I try to make myself available. I believe strongly in the value of collaboration. You know, when we come together and we work collaboratively on initiatives and projects, those things that we do have the potential to become embedded in our institutional culture, rather than just being seen as something else that we have to do. Trust is extremely important to me as a leader and in our institutions. If I'm selected to be your Vice President for Academic Affairs, I'm gonna work very hard to earn your trust. And I'll place my trust in you. And lastly, we have to empower one another. You know, some of the best things, the best results that I've seen as an administrator came from when a few people got together, they had a really great idea, and they were empowered to make it a reality. Now, I begin here by talking about my leadership values because, again, this informs my approach to how I would tackle increasing student success. And it's also my way of saying that any plan to do this is not something that I'm gonna create in a vacuum behind closed doors. It's something that I'm gonna engage the faculty and staff in to create collaboratively. So as I talk about the areas of focus today, and as I talk about some of the strategies, for me these represent possibilities. Possibilities of things that we can do when we work together to tackle the challenge of student success. And there are three areas where I think that we can focus in order to enhance student success at St. Petersburg College. The first is student achievement, promoting student retention, completion, and learning. The second is pathways and programs, driving enrollment growth, and making sure that our programs are aligned to workforce need. And lastly, and this will kind of run throughout the other areas, but lastly is an area of focus, faculty and staff engagement. Making sure that we're truly engaging all of our faculty and staff from across the institution through transparent communication as we work to enhance student success. And so I'll start by talking about student achievement. And this is specifically focusing on the strategic plan goal of increasing student success to 80.8% by the 2021 academic year. You know, I believe that in order to do that and accomplish that goal, we're going to need to look at specific populations of students that we can assist and examine kind of specific parts of the student experience, as it were. And the first area we need to address is to think about how we can increase the success of our African-American male students through some very targeted, purposeful interventions. I had the opportunity to watch the um, outstanding presentation that Dr. Smiley and I think Dr. Strickland in the back there um, did at the September District Board of Trustees meeting regarding the work of the African-American Male Student Success Task Force. And one of the possibilities you mentioned in your presentation was professional development centered around cultural competence. And this is an area where I have some experience. So I'm currently serving as the PI on a grant from the Office of Community College Leadership and Research from the University of Illinois. And we got that grant to launch what we call the Math Equity Institute. And the Math Equity Institute is a high impact professional development experience for faculty that's designed to increase success of African American male students in developmental math and prerequisite math courses. And it really consists of two parts. First, the institute involves a workshop that we held prior to the start of the fall semester. And our workshop was based on a framework that was outlined by J. Luke Wood in his book, Teaching Men of Color in the Community College. And so we focused on helping faculty develop skills around culturally relevant teaching, around demonstrating authentic care for students, how we can use positive and inclusive messaging in the classroom to create sense of belonging, and also how we can use intrusive interventions. And so how do we avoid that approach me first mentality when students are struggling? Now, the other half of the institute involves having faculty conduct office hours in the tutoring center. Uh, we know when we mine our SESI data that students say they know we have tutoring, they say we know it's important, they know it's important, um, but they're not using it at an equal rate. And we know that's because there are barriers, right? There's stigma sometimes attached to crossing that threshold of the Learning Resource Center or of the Tutoring Center. And so by embedding faculty in the Tutoring Center, our hope is it'll draw students in to meet with their professor and we can, along the way, show them what a great place and all the great resources are available to help them in all of their other classes and all their other studies as well.
Now certainly professional development isn't the only strategy. There are other strategies we can employ in this area. Mentoring programs have shown to be particularly effective. You know, and I, and I talked about sense of belonging a minute ago. Um, when you talk to some of our African American male students and you read this research, and I know many of you have, you know, they report not feeling like they belong on our campus, right? And how terrible is that? And mentoring programs have the potential to connect our students with a human at the college who's their person, right? Someone they can turn to when they need help or when they're struggling, and someone who can make them feel like they belong, because they do. Similarly, we need to think about our underprepared students and developing innovative strategies to help them succeed in their college level coursework. You know, we've all watched over the past couple years since Senate Bill 1720 was put into effect, the number of students who are taking placement testing and enrolling in, and I use traditional knowing that we've changed it up, but traditional developmental education courses is declining. And so I think that moving forward, one of the things we need to look at is how do we pair support resources? How do we pair just-in-time instruction along with those college cl level classes in order to help our students be successful? And the co-requisite approach is something that really has potential to do this. One approach, there are certainly others. You know, I reviewed um, SPC's developmental education report from last year, and I observed and noticed that um, the college was offering some limited sections of ENC 0055 as a co-requisite to college composition. Um, providing that kind of just-in-time support and instruction as students were working their way through that class. And, and I believe that this is a model we can look at growing and, and expanding because, again, the number of students who we're convincing to go that traditional dev ed route is really declining. I also think that the work being done as part of the QEP, the Neighborhoods for Success program, is absolutely fantastic and really is a model for how we pair support services with college level instruction. And you know, I saw that as part of the QEP, the institution is developing toolkits to be used across the college. And I think that we can really work to promote the use of those toolkits, and not just in our gateway classes, right? in all areas of the curriculum. Because reading, writing, and math deficiencies, and especially reading, they can trip students up everywhere they go. If you're not able to read, if you're not able to understand what you're reading, every single class you take is going to be extremely difficult. As half of our students come from online, we also need to think about how we promote persistence and success of online students. And again, as we think about moving kind of this overall needle about of student success, for me it's drilling in and looking at these specific populations. Because if we could increase their success, we can move that overall you know, metric in a positive direction. Uh, nationally, data would show that online students don't retain or don't persist at the same rates as their colleagues who are taking face-to-face -face classes. Um, and online persistence was actually the focus of my dissertation research. And specifically what I looked at was what are some concrete strategies that we can employ in order to help students successfully complete their, their online classes? Um, one of the strategies I looked at was using orientations for first-time online learners. You know, students have expectations about what online classes are going to be like. <laughs> and we hear some laughing because those expectations don't always match reality, right? And it creates what I like to call an experience expectation mismatch. And that can lead to dissatisfaction, that can lead to them not seeing the experience through. Orientations become a way for us to, from the beginning, lay out what the expectations of online learning is. We can also help students develop time management skills, which are of critical importance for online classes. And we can also help them understand the academic and professional skills related to technology that they're going to need in an online class, because those skills are often very different than the ways in which they currently use technology when they come to us. The other strategy I looked at was instructor verbal immediacy behaviors. And instructor verbal immediacy is the idea that we can use words and language to create closeness and to bridge psychological distance. And that, of course, is inherently present in the online environment. And this involves very simple things, like in a course introduction, instead of saying, welcome to my class, we would say, welcome to our class. In the lead into a module or a week of instruction, this week you will learn about. Instead, I'm going to say this week we will learn about, right? Creates that sense of belonging and that sense of community in a class. And in my research, I found that perception of instructor verbal immediacy was related to satisfaction, which prior research has shown is linked to persistence in online courses. The great thing about something like that is it's extremely simple to develop professional development to help faculty learn how to use those tools and resources in their online classes. 
I also have a passion for textbook affordability, and Dr. Smiley's here to my left, and I know you um, have worked on the textbook affordability report, and I think it's really important that we continue to implement innovative solutions to deal with the rising cost of textbooks. You know, it may seem odd to bring textbook affordability into a student achievement discussion. It might not, but for some it may. And you know, many of us have seen the Florida Virtual Campus Survey that was conducted, where they found that 64% of Florida students report not buying the books, and 43% of students report taking fewer classes because of the price of textbooks. And so as we think about helping students learn and be successful, and as we help, help, think about helping students get to degree faster, their inability or their you know, not purchasing books, that becomes a serious problem. For the past year and a half, I've been working with faculty on a program um, that we call the First Day Access Textbook Savings Program. And the First Day Program is an inclusive access program that is a partnership between the college, select publishers, and our bookstore provider, Barnes & Noble. And what this allows is it allows students to go into the learning management system, they click a button, they gain immediate access to their, their course materials right online, and they save 20 to 50% off the retail price of those materials. For students, it's great because they have what they need from day one of the course. There's no delay. There's no waiting. And also, they save a whole bunch of money. For faculty, the benefit is faculty can continue to use the resources that they become familiar with while still saving students money. We piloted our program for four semesters before launching this fall. And this fall, we had 70 faculty voluntarily participate to include their courses. And we saved students a collective $150,000 in textbook costs in a single semester. And lastly, I think it's important that we also think about how we can continue to enhance SPC's community of care by developing partnerships to provide resources to students. You know, we know one of the reasons why students don't succeed is because life gets in the way. And I think that as we move forward and we think about continued ways to help our students be successful, we're going to have to focus on providing resources to help them address those challenges. I think that the food banks offered on the campus and the student-driven nature of those are, are amazing. Um, the C campus grant that the college recently was awarded to help with childcare costs will make a huge difference. And there's other models that we can explore as well. Same, uh, excuse me, Seminole State College has a program they call Destination Graduation. And the Destination Graduation program is a partnership with United Way that places um, case managers and resource specialists directly on the campus to help students navigate that often confusing process of seeking help and applying for benefits. And it can also provide emergency grants for students when those life events come up unexpectedly. The second area I want to focus on is pathways and programs. And pathways and programs for me is important not only for the student success part of the equation, but also as we think about driving enrollment. Now, I don't need to tell you, obviously you know, that SPC is a national leader in the guided pathways work. And that's something that we obviously have to continue moving forward. One of the first things that I would do is to make sure that all of our faculty and staff feel engaged and involved, and all of our faculty and staff, from across academic affairs and student services, feel engaged and involved in our guided pathways work, and fully understand the need and the purpose for that. And I would do that by focusing on the leadership structures we have in place, both for the overall pathways work, as well as for each of our 10 academic and career communities. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've been leading a guided pathways initiative for about two years now. And we've taken a very broad approach, inclusive approach, to involving people in our project. And the benefit has been that people talk about guided pathways. They talk about pathways to students. And people who I sometimes never thought would do this are sitting students down and engaging in, with them in a dialogue about their academic journey. And they're doing that not just because we have really cool maps that are easy to follow, and, and you know, maps are pretty cool, I like maps, um, but they're doing it because they're invested in the work and they feel involved in it. Similarly, as we move forward and continue our guided pathways work, we need to think about ways we can continue to enhance our program maps. And so how do we make sure that our program maps are clear, they're understandable for students? How do we make sure that we're regularly folding in feedback that we get from our advising staff, from faculty, right, from students themselves as they work through these maps and experience our pathways? We also need to make sure that all of our program maps are aligned to career outcomes and specific career data, including our AA transfer intents. And I think a lot about this one because our AA students 
pick their major and ultimately their career with us. And I think it's very important that they understand the career outcomes that those pathways will lead them to, and especially for pathways that may require advanced education. I spend a lot of time thinking about students who are going to transfer and earn a psychology degree and hoping that they really understand that if they're going to go into the field of mental health, they need to continue their education further after the bachelor's. And I'm not sure students always understand that. And that um, is something I talk a lot about with my colleagues on that one specifically. So making sure we've lined up all all of those program maps with career outcomes. Um, and I think we also have an opportunity to make sure that our program maps represent stackable credentials. And by doing that, we can create on-ramps into our maps and pathways to show how people can utilize mechanisms we have in place or new mechanisms to turn non-credit experiences into credit. You know, and I, I Dr. Henning, right, we can, we can partner with the Workforce Institute and think about ways that we can use the non-credit training and the industry certifications and turn those into college credit as an additional way to engage people in our programs. In a related light, we also need to think about how we can continue to develop new workforce programs that support our area's growing economy. You know, I think we have opportunities to engage employers and leaders, um, host forums. And we do this sometimes, but I think we have an opportunity to engage employers and industry partners that we don't currently work with, right? What are those industries we're not serving? What are the industries we don't have programs that work with? And bringing those folks in to find out, in addition to all of the great labor data we can look at, where the need really is. So we can think about developing new workforce programs to not only satisfy local workforce need, but also to provide opportunities for people in our community to get a degree and, and, and lead to a great career. And as we think about growing enrollment, right, broadening our program mix, aligning with emerging fields can help us appeal to new students, new demographics of students, and especially our adult and non-traditional learners. Because we know for adult learners, they're very focused on this, right? They want to see how this is going to lead to career and what those outcomes are going to be. I also think we have opportunities to increase the number of dual enrollment students who continue with us after high school. And I think the part of this involves reframing the message of dual enrollment. Instead of talking about it as free credit that transfers anywhere, thinking about it as the beginning of your SPC pathway, an early start, a jump start, a head start, um, whatever phrase you like to insert there. You know, we can work with our K-12 partners to create very clear maps that show how a student can dual enroll, spend maybe a year or less at SPC when they get here, and then because of programs like Ignite and Fuse, they're guaranteed admission to the university. And, and that may or may not appeal to students, but that'll appeal to parents if we can get that message to them because they'll see uh, how much money they save and you know, how their kid can stay at home a little bit longer, which everyone wants. Uh, and lastly, well, sometimes, I guess, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I have a niece who's four right now, and like, she's still like, I want her, but I understand. Like, when she gets older, it's going to be, yeah, I get, we get it, we get it, OK. Uh, and lastly, uh, making sure that our course schedules meet student need and student demand and promote student success. You know, and obviously, this involves making sure that we're offering classes in the times and the formats and the modalities that are best for our students, that meet demand, and that really provide those opportunities for success. Um, an initiative that I was involved in related from uh, was around converting from semester-based course scheduling to yearly course scheduling. And what this actually enabled us to do was we published the yearly schedule when fall registration began so that students could make more informed decisions about their academic journey. You know, program maps that we build as part of Pathways are fantastic, but the class schedule has so many other details that students care about, like times, locations, modalities, and sometimes even professors, right? <laughs> so I'm going to close. Oh, no, I'm not going to close. I'm going to quickly talk about faculty and staff engagement, excuse me, because all of these things that we're talking about, we could not do this if we did not engage our faculty and staff. And one of the first things that I would do if I'm selected as vice president for academic affairs is I would want to meet with faculty and staff to learn more about the opportunities as well as some of the challenges we have. My goal would be to meet with all 367 full-time faculty. And I would like to do that either one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups of two or three. And I see some looks around the room, sometimes surprised <laughs> looks. I understand that that's an immense task. And I can assure you I have great ability to keep a lot of plates spinning in the air and to manage a very, very booked calendar. But for me, that's important to understand the full landscape of what's happening around the institution. I'm a big believer in shared governance. And I would look forward, I think Dr. Ulrich in the back, right, from Faculty Senate. I know I called you out, I'm sorry. Uh, or somewhere, right, where, where, did I screw it up? Okay. Um, so I got it, I did get it right, okay, all right. 
Uh, so collaborating with the faculty governance organization. Um, in my institution, I previously served as the administrative liaison, and I made a priority to communicate, bring information to the Senate, and also to ensure that we took action and addressed the issues that they brought up and made those things a priority. Um, I'm a strong supporter of faculty professional development, and I think it's important that we continue to increase those opportunities. I think the, the CEDL is a fantastic model for faculty-driven professional development, and my priority is providing professional development that meets the goals that faculty have, because for me, that's what meaningful professional development is about. And faculty development is important to me not only as an administrator, but I've continued to teach since becoming an administrator. And so I myself am a consumer of faculty professional development, because um, I'm always looking for great things to take back to my classroom and uh, make myself more effective. And lastly, you know, I talked about meeting with full-time faculty. It would be important with me to also meet with our adjunct faculty because we have to engage and involve our adjunct faculty and recognize them. We couldn't achieve our mission without our adjunct faculty, right? Many of them are working professionals who do what they do in the field every day and bring that knowledge back as they help our students prepare for their future careers. I'm aware that the adjunct faculty um, recently voted to unionize, and I would look forward to working with the adjunct leaders as the college engages in that collective bargaining process. I think that we have a shared interest of not only helping our students be successful, but making SPC not just a great, but the best place to teach. Absolutely the best, hands down. So I'm gonna to close today with a little story. And um, a few years ago, several years ago actually, I worked with a student who was doing quite well in developmental education math, and he was trying to accelerate through the sequence. And this was prior to Senate Bill 1720 and all of the developmental education reforms. And so I met with him a few times during the semester, and during one of our last meetings, I said, make sure you come back at the end and tell me how everything turned out. Like, tell me how you did in the class. So I was in my, you know, and students don't always do that. We always want to hear, but they don't, and I can look, but I like when they come tell me. Um, and so I was working in my office around holiday break, and my student showed up. And he said, I just wanted to stop by to let you know that I got an A in the class. And then he said, I notice you like Scooby-Doo. Now, if you've never been in my office, that won't make a lot of sense. If you have the opportunity to visit my office, and, and shameless plug, I hope you do, um, but if you have the opportunity to visit my office, you'll notice I got a lot of Scooby-Doo stuff in there. And he said, you know, I want to say thank you for helping me and working with me this semester. And he said, I brought you something. And what he handed me was this little plastic mystery machine, <laughs> which is a replica of the van that Scooby and the gang drove around in, right, in all the episodes, you know, and if you're a fan of the animated or the live action. <laughs> you know, and over the years, I've really come to think about Scooby-Doo as a metaphor for what we do and ensuring student success, because at the beginning of every episode, the idea of catching the bad guy seemed scary, it seemed insurmountable, and you know what? Helping our students succeed can sometimes seem the same way. But what did we learn from them, right? We learned that when the group comes together, when they communicate, when they collaborate, when they trust each other, and when they empower one another, they can always accomplish the mission. And I'm firmly convinced that we as educators, as smart people, can do the same thing when we come together for the goal of student success. So thank you. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity for being here. And I would love to answer your questions. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Painter. Um, just to let you know, uh, I succeeded Dr. Ulrich as president of oh, FGO. Okay. So. <laughs> that was disappointing. So that is Dr. Ulrich. I didn't screw that part up. OK, perfect. Awesome. Good. Um, my got question, one out of two questions right, right? So um, you talked about uh, one of your focus areas being on pathways and programs. Mm -hmm. And you talked about engaging faculty in helping with the guided pathways work. Can you specifically talk about how you would uh, engage and motivate faculty to participate in that. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think, first of all, it's important that all of the faculty and staff have an opportunity to be involved. And, you know, there's a number of ways we can do that. One of the things that we did when we first launched our Guided Pathways work is we simply put a call out and we invited faculty. We told them
told them to show up. Whether you think this is important, whether you think it's stupid, whether you want to be involved or don't, come to the room and let's have a dialogue, right? Get involved in the work. And what that ultimately translated into was we set up for each of our pathways, we set up work groups. And some of our work groups may have 20 people. And for an institution of our size, that's pretty significant. And so we've really made a point to make sure that at moments, you know, pivotal moments throughout the year, throughout other various opportunities we have, that we allow faculty who want to be involved to get involved, to come in, to learn more about it, and we build a leadership structure that it includes and involves a lot of people. And so we're at a point where a significant number of our faculty have been involved. And, and I'm really convinced that that's sort of the way to go about it, is making sure we're communicating about it, we're hosting forums, events, we're providing mechanisms where faculty can get involved in that work. You know, and um, we did a, a meeting at the end of last year. So kind of our cycle is we, we started creating program maps for the year we were in and then got to the end of the year and realized, oh, wow, now we need to update them for the coming academic year when we're going to start using them with students. And so what we did was we hosted a big joint work group meeting, brought all of our work groups together in a giant room and invited others to come in. You know, if you want to come see what's going on, if you want to be involved, if you want to provide input, please join us. And so I think it just involves making sure that we have a leadership structure that's inclusive, where faculty can get involved, and making sure we're hosting events and opportunities where we can talk about it. Um, I know, I believe you had your professional development day couple weeks back, um, Discovery Day. Um, we do ours in the, in the spring. And one of the things we did was so uh, a colleague of mine bought one of those like wheel spinning things, you know the obnoxious things at conferences that are like, oh, you want the pen? You have to spin the wheel. You might get the beach ball instead. <laughs> so <laughs> he bought one of those, and I'm always like, how can we use this? And so what we did was we did a Pathways Trivia booth during our professional development day, and we had people come up and spin the wheel. They got a question, and what we did as a, as a walkaway item is they got a little bubble that you can write on with like a marker, and we told them, go hang this in your office, write an idea about Pathways, take a picture and email it to us. So I think there's a lot of just fun, creative ways that we can engage folks in pathways. And again, make sure that if someone really wants to be involved, we're giving them the opportunity to be involved. Did that answer your question? Yes, did that? Did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I noticed in your bio that you had the opportunity to serve as an interim vice president for academic affairs for a, during a transition period. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what was the most important lesson you took away from that that you think will help you in this role? Wow, that's a great question. Um, thank you for your question. So, you know, the thing I think I walked away with was it gave me an understanding of the scope of the role, the types of duties and responsibilities, and it gave me the opportunity to familiarize myself with those so that, you know, at, at some point in the future, if I am able to have that opportunity to step into the role, I feel very comfortable with that. You know, I think the other thing about it, and this is what draws me to administration, is that in a position like Vice President for Academic Affairs, you really do have a lot of opportunities opportunity to make a positive impact on the institution, right? You can bring people together, you can see things from that institutional perspective, and you can get folks to the table to address some of the challenges that you're having and take advantage of some of the opportunities you have. And I, and I tend to always talk about it like that, not just because I'm in an interview, but taking advantage of opportunities and addressing challenges. I think both are equally fun. I think it's fun to sit down and say, you know, we have an opportunity to do X, Y, Z. I also tend to think it's fun, you know, when I worked with the Faculty Senate, I think it's fun when they bring a challenge forward, you know, and how can we work together to solve that? Because everything's a puzzle that we can, we can figure out if we work hard enough on. Back here, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Painter. Um, so similar question to what Jeff asked, both faculty like-minded. Um, I wanted to kind of focus in on the PD opportunities that you had yeah. mentioned. Um, so could you speak to some of the strategies you would use to engage faculty in those opportunities? Because we have a lot of faculty that are busy. How, how are you sure. gonna get them to do these um, professional development? Yeah, I think it's important. That's a great question. I think it's really super important to think about the format we offer professional development in, right? And so, you know, if you think about our class schedules, we offer face-to-face, -face, we offer blended, hybrid, express session, full session, quasi-session. We have all kinds of formats and offerings for our students. And I think it's really important we do the same 
for faculty professional development. Um, one of the things I did at my institution, and this is, this is so simple and so cheap, but it has been extremely important um, and powerful. People like it, is there's a product from uh, Magna. They're the people that do the um, teaching professor conference, you may be familiar with. And it's called 20 Minute Men, it's called Monday Morning Mentor, excuse me. And, and what they've done is, and so Magna loves to like make content and then like repackage it in different ways to, they're very entrepreneurial. Um, and the Monday Morning Mentor product, you get every week, you get access to one mentor. And we're able to push that out every Monday and say, hey, this week, here's a topic. It takes only 20 minutes of your time. And um, you can engage. So it sounds like that's something you're doing already. And that, yeah, that's been so, you know, it, but thinking about more things like that, right? How can we create our own content to do stuff like that and push it out that's quick and it's accessible? I also think with faculty professional development, it's important to focus on the goals that faculty have, right? And so when I first became a campus dean, you know, I'd have people that would bring their travel paperwork to me and they'd be like, well, I'm going off to my required conference for this year. And you know, and I could see they had no desire to go to that conference. And so I started saying, well, what is it you want to do? Well, what I really want to do is there's an online extension class at UF that I can go and use in my classroom. I would rather do that you know, than sort of have check boxes for faculty to check off. And so I think it involves not only that format and modality piece, but learning more about the goals. What are the professional development goals that faculty have? And then how do we provide those resources to help them meet the goals? Because for me, that's what meaningful professional development is about. Um, and, 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 I, and I talk to faculty about service to the college in the same way, right? You know, If a faculty gets involved with a project that they're passionate about, great things happen. If it's like, well, I joined this committee because someone told me I have to sit on this committee, you know, then they're sitting on a committee, right? So I think the, the faculty professional development piece is the same way. What are those goals and how can we help meet them? And then looking for those creative, innovative, innovative, innovative ways that we can help them meet those goals. Did that answer your question? Your Monday morning mentor is like, for $600, that's like, <laughs> that's like universally well loved. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I love Scooby-Doo, so. <laughs> awesome, good, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us some of the processes that you have used in the past to start new programs. Absolutely. So I'll talk about um, our Bachelor of Education programs, because um, I was the supervising dean when we decided to do that. Um, and we created those programs as a direct response. Um, so we're in Polk County in Lakeland, and we had a um, large public university that was related to one that's in this area that uh, <laughs> made an exit. You may or may not have heard about that, right? And, and when they did, there were no longer any public um, university education programs available. And so we heard loud and clear from our school district that there was a need for that program in our area. They have hundreds of openings every year for teachers, specifically at the elementary level, and we wanted to make sure we were helping to fulfill that need. So one of the first things we did was we created some groups and some task forces that involved folks, not only from the college and faculty and content experts, but we brought in school district people. You know, We brought in staff from the school district who deal with faculty hiring, faculty retention, educator training. And we did a long process of kind of talking about, you know, we know we have state standards, we have FEEPs, we have professional competencies, um, we have all these other you know, things we need to meet in order to have our program be approved, um, but what are the things you really value? And one of the things that came up in that process was, you know, yes, they want certified elementary teachers, but they want elementary teachers who feel comfortable teaching STEM. Right? who can teach science, math, and technology type courses and infuse that into the curriculum. And so consequently, we built our program with a heavy science, technology, engineering, and math focus. And we infuse that throughout the courses. And we have some courses that focus specifically on that. Um, but we brought, we brought industry, you know, we brought folks in from the field to help us learn a little more about what their workforce need and what, what that was valued. Um, I've also worked with not just new programs, but existing ones. I have a lot of experience working with industry advisory boards. And I think that industry advisory boards are amazing if you use them in a very purposeful way. Um, I watched it at early in my administrative career, um, some very well-meaning program directors be like, so advisory board, advise us, you know, and, and it was either nothing or where you didn't really want it to be. And, um, so I'm a big proponent of making sure we're really kind of focusing how we use those advisory boards, asking them very targeted questions, asking them to share things they're seeing, they're hearing, what are those trends, having them look at specific parts of curriculum and give feedback on that in terms of how it's preparing students. 
I'm also, um, experience wise, we typically, kind of a model I'm used to is we, we don't hire staff on the front end. We sort of use internal resources to kind of get the idea rolling um, and a lot of working and relying with partners and then we sort of look to bring in external staff. New staff, I should say, external. Yes, and thank you for your presentation. I had a question. You talked about knowing how to kind of juggle different plates in the airs. And yeah. You gave some examples with faculty and obviously with the adjunct union, you did sure. your research. How would you prioritize all of the goals and the competing issues sure. that you would walk into if you have the opportunity to get this position? Well, I always prioritize people stuff first. You know, for me, um, the work day doesn't doesn't begin only at eight and doesn't end at five, right? There's time before eight and there's time after five and there's a lot of time to work on projects and paperwork. And I always try hard in my work day to prioritize the people stuff. Um, I certainly have a lot of folks that do like to contact me out of those eight to five hours and I'm perfectly fine with that. But you know, a lot of those meetings, those things that need interaction have to take place during the work day. And so I always prioritize um, those. In terms of like the bigger picture where I think probably your question was going about initiatives and challenges and opportunities you know, I think that for me, one of the things I like to listen and learn first, and that's not to say that I'm slow, so don't interpret it that way, um, but I like to fully kind of understand the landscape. I like to understand the history. I also like to know where the landmines are, the ones that I can detect. And so, you know, coming in, one of my priorities, again, would be meeting with people kind of learning and starting to do that research work, but also looking at what some of the low hanging fruit is, right? What are some of the things that we can tackle right now that are easy to do as we kind of map out the course for the bigger picture? I also believe strongly, I'm a, I'm a huge Apple fan, like I have my Apple Watch and all that. And, you know, Apple talks a lot about kind of managing the business for the long term. And um, sometimes I think they might take too long of you, but I do like that notion of managing the business for the long term long term. And so, you know, I don't necessarily feel a need to come in and within a week be like, hey, look, new pathway, like brand, you know, we did something like that. But thinking about what that long term plan looks like and thinking how, about how we can map out some of those opportunities and then addressing some of the more immediate things while, again, prioritizing the learning, the listening, the interacting, the talking to people. Um, a large way I get my work done is through relationships. And so, you know, that's, that's my currency I use. And so a lot of my early time would be building those relationships. Did that answer your question? Did I? Okay. So to that end, and thank you for your presentation also. Uh, so 13 deans, mm -hmm. uh, dean of workforce development starting in January, uh, six provosts, many campuses throughout the college in Pinellas County. What would your first 90 days look like, trying to juggle all that um, with the job? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, again, I would want to start scheduling out, and my vision would be that you know, by the end of the spring semester, or perhaps the first part of summer, that I could fit in the um, meetings with faculty, you know, meeting again in small groups. And, and the reason I focus on one-on-one -on -one or in small groups is, you know, I want people to feel comfortable. And so either way, you know, folks say, I want to bring a partner or two because these are the people I work with regularly and we have some things to share. Great. If folks want that one-on-one, -on -one, I want to provide them with that as well. Um, I would certainly also make sure I establish, you know, regular, I'm, I'm, in addition to the ones I'm sure already exist, right, regular meetings, regular interactions with people. And I would make it a priority to make sure and honestly, not just for the first 90 days, but throughout what I would hope would be a long tenure, is visibility all around the college, right? You know, I think it's super important that we as administrators in a multi-campus institution, that we, you know, we show up in places, right? We're available and we're present. The power of, of um, just running into someone when you're on a campus. Having that happenstance meeting, I think, is so important. Um, I'm sure you use video technology for meetings. Um, we do the same. But you know, I can vary my location that I take a meeting from, right? So I can send a message that that's important. So I would prioritize, again, making sure I start getting those meetings with faculty and staff underway, all of the regular meetings, make sure I'm interacting with deans and other direct reports, and make sure I'm around. Um, and, and part of my vision, too, for meeting with faculty and staff wouldn't be, you know, come see me in the Scooby-Doo office, but it would be, you know, I'll come to you. Um, I'm in a college-wide role now, and so I'm very used to, you know, I have my iPad I take notes on and I will travel and we'll pull up some chairs wherever we can and we'll have a meeting and, and have a conversation and a dialogue. Did that make sense? Did that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Um, 
with that, I would just want to thank you for being here this afternoon. I think we've run out of time, and um, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for the opportunity, and thanks for your time today. <laughs>